So in 2001, John was doing a lot of touring to promote his solo record to record Only Water for 10 Days at a show at Ruby's in Hollywood. I met um, a guy who was here on vacation named Ignacio Renicio. He was here from Spain. He worked at a TV station in Spain, and he wanted to do an interview with John, so wanted to know what the best approach would be. I said he should probably speak to John's manager, Louis, who just happened to be outside the venue. So he went over, talked to him, exchanged emails, come back. He and I exchanged emails as well. And a day or so later, he emails me saying he's been granted an interview with John, but if I would help write some questions for him. He also mentioned, you know, he doesn't speak English very well, and if I can conduct the interview for him. So I said, yeah. He also didn't know where the Chateau Marmont was, where John was uh, living at the time. So I said, no problem. I'll pick him up at Venice Beach, get him to the Chateau. We're there a little early. Uh, The front desk uh, calls his room. He doesn't answer. So I'm thinking, okay, this isn't going to happen. 20, 30 minutes goes by. Uh, They try him again, and this time they say, oh, he said you can go on up. So now it seems like it's a real thing. So we go. Sure enough, John answers the door, lets us in, and we start setting up our equipment. And here it is for the first time, the John Frusciante Chateau Marmont interview from July 18th, 2001. You said you're rehearsing the day that was the Peppers? Mm-hmm. You guys, uh, you guys recorded the new album yet, or did you demos for that? Uh, we, we, we go to a rehearsal studio every day, and, and we, uh, we write songs. We've got all the songs, the music of all the songs written, um, We've got like 20 songs or so written and that Anthony's has an idea what he's going to do on. Some of them he has a whole set of lyrics. Some of them he has just a basic idea of what direction he's going in or he has an idea of what he's going to do in the verse, but he doesn't have any lyrics. You know, that kind of... He, they're, they're, uh, they're in all different states of completion as far as Anthony's concerned. And as a band, we're just getting started playing stuff over and over and tightening things up and figuring out, making arrangements solid. Like, you know, a lot of songs don't have endings and, you know, every, everything's in, but, but we have the, the, the basic, uh, the meat of, you know, of the 20 songs or so that we'll record. A few more may get written during the, you know, next couple of months because we're not going to go into the studio until, we're not going to actually record until October, um, because we're going away on a trip in August on a little two-week tour in Europe, and uh, and we're and we're we're uh, we've got we've got a f- you know we've we've got a few uh, I mean but we're but we're taking that pressure off of ourselves as far as right now writing we're not we're not. The, the main objective now is just to make the songs that we've already got better because Anthony, you know, will have a little too much on his plate if, right. if we Absolutely. keep writing. And, and we're real happy about the stuff that we've got. We've got great, you know, I, it'll be my favorite album. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> is, uh, are you guys working with Rick Rubin? Uh-huh. I'm going to ask you some old questions, too, that people always ask. Like, what's the question? You know, like, how you and Bob Forrest first met up and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, well, they used to open for the Chili Peppers a lot, and I used to go see the Chili Peppers. This is in like 1986, 1987, and uh, you know I was like 16 years old, 17 years old, and I used to go see them, uh, and uh, I think when I. When I met him, I guess it was just because I met Flea uh, through my friend D.H. And uh, Flea was considering having me in the Chili Peppers when Halal died. And and uh, they hired Blackbird McKnight from Parliament. And, uh, and, and I... And, uh, I think it was, you know, it was like a band sort of decision to hire Blackbird, Flea being the only person in the band who even knew what I played like. And he didn't really push for me hard enough. I guess he liked the idea of Blackbird at the time, too. But in the back of his head, I think he was always thinking of me. So then at one point, 
Thelonious Monster needed a guitar player, so Flea called me up and he was like, listen, my friend Bob needs a guitar player. Um, I feel kind of funny about letting you go do it because I, you know, I, I guess I, I shouldn't, but, you know, I, but, but, uh, but I, I keep imagining, you know, you being in the Chili Peppers, but, you know, whatever, I mean, he, he's like, I don't know if it's going to work out with Blackbird, but I guess, you know, we're not going to fire him right now, so I guess I'll, you know, I'm going to give you Bob's number. And so I was really like, uh, and, and Flea said it to Bob too, he was like, well, Bob, I've got first dibs on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, uh, and, and so, uh, so, so, you know, I auditioned for them that day and that was when I met Bob and, you know, that's, you know, that's sort of the end of the story. I mean, because I went there and, you know, from, from there, I, Anthony was at the audition that I did for Bob, so I, I, I was only in Thelonious Monster for a few hours before the Chili Peppers decided to kick Blackbird out and hire me. Oh, really? So it was just a few hours? Yeah. I thought you played with Thelonious for a while. Well, well I like, did play for a couple of weeks. I played the shows that they had scheduled, you oh, know. Okay. Like, they, they had... Uh, Cal State, LA, or Cal State Florida, something like that. Maybe, yeah. There was some college show and a couple of shows at Raji's and a show at at a bar called Molly Malone's here in, in Fairfax. And, um... Now, the lineup with the longest was it uh, you and uh, the other guitar player? Was it Chris? You were Chris was a rhythm guitar player, and Rob Graves was the bass player, and Pete Weiss was the drummer, and Bob was the singer. Okay. Is this uh, before, like, uh, Stormy Weather and stuff like that had come out? Or? It was It was right when Stormy Weather was about to come out. Is Thelonious Monster real popular in Spain or something? Uh, <laughs> well, it's always for a few people, you know. Right. People yeah. like there's, there's just always been confusion about you being a Thelonious Monster. Not being I know. Monster. Sometimes I read things that are that are that are not true about it. No. The whole, about the whole thing. Real. Yeah, like like I I guess I might as well say the story of the audition because I've read it said in wrong ways. It was just that I went in there and I played and. And uh, I played with the band. Bob was upstairs with Anthony, and uh, the band, the band all said, you know, well, I guess we got to wait for Bob. But I mean, as far as we're concerned, you're hired. I mean, you're, you know, you're a great guitar player. And and then, and then Bob came down, and we sang, you know, he sang a couple of songs, and I played, and him and Anthony just got off on it, and that, that was. Uh, that was all. I've read funny little quotes of I can't remember what they were, <laughs> but funny little like. Like the Bob and the Anthony got to huddle, and then they came out there like okay, you're playing guitar. But not yeah, I mean, I mean, there was no, there was no like when Bob came down, there was just no, there was no di- real discussion about it. It was just like, I was playing really well, and and uh, everybody was real excited about it. There was no corny little. <laughs> I just re- I've read little corny little like. Yeah. Did you know all the Thelonious songs? Yeah. Mo- most. Mo- well, no. I mean, I I was familiar with their their two albums. Um. You know, so. But uh, but as far as learning them on guitar, I, I had I had learned them all like the night before. You know, <laughs> which you know, I mean that's I I can I'm you know I've always been good like that. I can learn things. Really quickly, you know. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, uh, yeah, most things I can do. Yeah. Um, there was a movie uh, a few years back called Gift, the Perry Farrell. Yeah, th- that was the first place that any of my solo songs. That's the first time I heard it. Um, yeah, that, well, that was the first place it was ever released. How, was, how did you and Perry get involved in that and donate that song to the movie? And why did you make that song? Uh, well... I was, you know, I was recording all my stuff on the four track that would eventually be my first solo record, and um, and I was, and uh, I went to see, I was going to see Porno for Pyros. They played at Castaic Lake, uh, you know, a couple hours away, and me and all my, uh, me and all my junkie friends went up there, and Kurt Cobain was opening for them on acoustic guitar and it was just a real you know it was it was that period of everybody's 
drug taking where it was just all real out in the open and and fun and like we we all just went out to this uh, this outdoor sort of beautiful area by a lake and and uh, and I came up to Perry and I said I don't have this song that's the same vibe as uh, as your movie because I had seen this little half hour version of his movie um, it was like an advanced videotape that they were giving to people at Warner Brothers so they could get more money to finish the movie right. and uh, and it was called Scenes from Gift and and uh, and so I I uh, I said I have I have a song that's the same vibe as your m- movie. Um, I I uh, do you need any more music for your movie? Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.
I just played the song Life's a Bath, and that was the first time I ever played a solo show. I just I played the song Life's a Bath, and then I threw up on my friend Gibby Haynes. <laughs> on stage? I, 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 just, I felt it coming while I was on stage, and I, and I just threw the guitar down, and I rushed over to Gibby, who was sort of sitting on the stage, but sitting on the floor, and I threw up all over him. <laughs> and he was just laughing. He's used to it, I suppose. <laughs> Now, that, but, uh, the show in 1997. Like yeah, the show in 1997 was uh, was not one of my favorite shows I've ever done. No, I I really didn't have any business playing a show at that point, just because I wasn't I wasn't uh, I think I was only playing a show because I had recently gotten off of heroin, and so I I didn't I just wanted to sort of do something just for the sake of doing something or. To, you know, just to, it, I wouldn't really call it creative. It was more just to get like some sort of attention from people or some sort of ego gratification of playing a show. You know, I mean, to be honest, it, it wasn't really about I had this <clears throat> because I wasn't making people happy with my music off stage. It's like I'd play a song or two for somebody, but it wasn't like now where like I can I can pretty much entertain any of my friends if I feel like it, or and if they feel like listening for a half hour or 45 minutes or five minutes or whatever, but I can, I can, like, uh, I can actually, like, entertain them in my living room or whatever. At that time, I wasn't really, I didn't really have my music that together to, or my singing that together to where I was making people happy with it. I, it was pretty much just, just to feel like I was doing something. That's actually what it is, more so than, than what I said before. It's not so much ego gratification. It's just to, when, you're, when you haven't done anything for a few years in front of people, it, it just you just feel the need to do something for the sake of doing something as opposed to because you really have songs right now. I mean, you know, the songs I was playing, they, they were all things that I'd, you know, written a few years before. I didn't have new songs or anything like that. The song called the Circles of View that you played. Like back That's out there. Is, right. Is that a cover song? Is that a no, I wrote that when I was like fourteen or fifteen. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everyone thinks it's a cover song because it's never been on any albums. Right. No, it's. There, it's always you know, people asking, you know, is that an original song? Is that a cover song? Yeah, I wrote it when I was like fifteen years old, I think. Okay. The song called Fall Through the Ground. The song Smoke in the Streets of Gold. Yeah. It's real sort of. Which one is it? Kind of has like some weird keyboard kind of sounds like oh. Oh yeah, that's I recorded that when I was seventeen. Is there a longer version of that song? Because almost seems like it's kept out really soon. Um. Is it really like a really long? It went song? a little longer than that. Let's see. But it wasn't like an epic twenty-minute song or anything. No, like no. Something. And there's but there's three other songs that I recorded at that period of time that I may or may not still have tapes of. Um, a lot of my tapes got lost uh when i when i left this one house that i was living in because the 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 guy who owned the house was threatening to send the cops to the house and so i i left and i left all my shit there and a friend of mine cleaned the house out for me but my tapes my cassette tapes of all my masters and stuff were in a a, a cupboard and he didn't realize that they were in the cupboard and I wasn't clear-headed enough to remember to tell him, to remember that he wasn't going to realize that there was st something in there, and so, uh, so most of my record, most of my master tapes of my recordings from when I was a teenager got lost, thrown away, or whatever. But there was three other songs like "Fall Through the Ground" that were really good. They were the best stuff that I'd done up to that, t up to that point when I was 17 years old. Not the organization MAPS, mm -hmm. was that the organization that you went through to sort of clean up and were they really... Well, I didn't have any money the last time that I got off of drugs and uh, and so they, they, I guess they have some sort of a deal with uh, with Los Encinas Hospital uh, where they, you know, I guess they pay them a portion of the money but they sort of, you know, they work together to you know, making it so a musician who has no money can go into a hospital that costs, you know, $20,000 or whatever to, to go to, or, you know.
I didn't have any money at that time, so they arranged it to where I could go in the hospital. And um, was it a long battle trying to get off of it and going back on drugs and back and forth, or was it just one time you were able to stop and get help? And um, I don't know. I guess you know you you, you really can't. It, I, I didn't really think of it as a battle because I was never really a hundred percent about wanting to to quit doing drugs. You know, um, I I never really there there was never any point during like I guess the first time I tried to quit taking drugs was in like nineteen ninety around Christmas time of 95 to 96 and uh, and and uh, never the whole time I was I did a 30 day program at Exodus Hospital in Marina Del Rey and and uh, n at no point that I was there did it ever occur to me that I wanted to stop doing everything you know um Whereas when I was at Los Encinas Hospital, you know, and and I and I there was another, so I I quit that time, then I started doing them again, then I quit another time, and then I started doing them again, and then the whole time it was always like I, you know, I don't, I'm not going to make any rules for myself. I can do whatever I feel like doing. You know, when I was at Los Encinas, it occurred to me that like that it, like about halfway through the time that I was there, all of a sudden I realized like that it would that it would be a really good idea for me to just see what it was, see what happened in my life if I stopped doing everything, you know, if I, if I'm, if I became strict with myself and I didn't smoke pot and I didn't drink alcohol and I, I, you know, basically tried to live a completely clean life for a year, just see what happens, you know. And so that was, that was the deal I made with myself and if, and it, you know, it turned out, you know, it turned out uh, really well. You know, every every like, I noticed that uh, a certain kind of uh, a certain kind of energy uh, builds up. You get a you 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 get a certain kind of momentum by uh, by not giving in to constantly trying to take things into you to take things into yourself to to make yourself feel the way you want to feel at that moment. And what ends up happening is like, you know, maybe you don't get that immediate gratification of the rush of a hit of crack or something at the moment that you feel like taking a hit of crack, but a week later, you, you, uh, you've started being friends with a friend who you haven't been friends with for years. And, and uh, you, somebody smiles at you that you, you haven't, nobody's really given you a genuine smile for, uh, for a year, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, that week you made 15 people smile, you know, uh, these kind of things just start happening, and you start, I, I just started, uh, I just started really getting off on, on the feeling of not being on drugs, you know, so, so, uh, yeah, I guess it was just in the cards for me to stop at that time that I did, um, because the other couple of times that I tried to quit, it never occurred to me that there could be any advantage to uh, to to stopping doing everything. You know. Right. Um, you did a tour with uh, uh, Norwood Fisher. And right. Warren on yeah. Uh huh. How did that come about? It's, it's one of one of Bob's bright ideas. <laughs> one of Bob's bright ideas. He, I, Bob wanted me to do it, play with Thelonious Monster, and that I could play a show of my own as well. And I was like, I was like, I don't know. Let me think about it. And he kept bugging me about it. And I agreed to to do it. And then I I rehearsed and I saw how unorganized the whole thing was. And I said. Um, I changed my mind, I don't want to do it, you know, um, you know, we don't, we're not having enough time to rehearse, and, and it's not right to go out and do a tour when you only do two or three rehearsals, and I just, uh, and, and, um, 
you know, I, Norwood called me up and Bob tried to convince me and they, they were they were both kind of on my case about it. And so I agreed to do it. And my girlfriend at the time also really wanted me to do it just because she was sick of me just sitting around the house listening to music and smoking pot and doing speed and stuff. So, so then, so then, um, I, you know, I, I did it and, uh, you know, it's what it felt like to do a tour where there was no rehearsing done or anything. I mean, half the time we would just go on stage and just one, two, three, four, not knowing what we were going to play, you know, <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was not, it, it, the music I played on that tour is definitely not something that I'm proud of, you know. Well, the songs are, you know, the songs I wrote, you know, when I was a teenager, most of the songs that I was playing on that tour mm-hmm. were songs that I wrote when I was like 15 years old, 16 years old. I, I, uh, you know, it's not the songs that I have a problem with, but just like to be playing on stage with people who don't know your songs. I mean, a lot of the time, like when we started the tour, they knew like two songs of mine. And then we would like continue the tour and I would try to get Norwood into the bus before the show and show him this song or that song. But, you know, I mean, they did good under the circumstances, but I mean, you know, for a band not to rehearse or sound check or anything and expect to go out in front of people, it's just like... But it was a fun tour. I mean, on the good side of that tour, it was really funny. Like, the people on the tour were really funny people. And once I started traveling in the bus with everybody, it was a a rough tour. It was like, there was shows every single night, and it was was probably like, you know, there was a couple of buses, but each bus had like 20 people on. You know, each bus was full. Each bus had, uh, each, every bunk was full. And, and, uh, and the people were really hilarious, like, you know, the people on the tour. Like, I used to just sit in the back with uh, with Dirty Walt from Fishbone and watch, like, movies of, porno movies with midgets and stuff, you know. Porno movies with, like, little, like, men fucking a little midget woman, and, you know. Like, <laughs> oh, God. He used to just sit there watching and stuff, or... You know, you know, listening to his fucking. Did you uh, play with Polonius during that tour too? Uh, for part of it, and then towards the end of it, I, me and Bob got in a fight, and I, and I quit playing with him. I mean, um, it seems like that happens a lot with Bob. There's always some fucking like every time I've ever, I've been friends with him, like three three times where that that period of friendship ended with a. Fight, you know, it's like it makes it hard to get close to somebody when they when they've been that way to you a few times. You know what I mean? It's like I I love him, but I I don't I I I always sort of try to keep it an arm's distance from him just because it's always ended up like that, and I you know it's hard to I mean I forgive him. It's not it's not like uh, but but it does it, you know and to be honest it, it makes it you know, a friend should, should, uh, a friend should stick to a friend and not, and not all, all of a sudden lunge out at them, you know, which he's done with me three times. Um, the cover art for Neon Gelada, mm-hmm. where was that shot? My girlfriend, Tony Oswald, was, uh, making a movie that she wrote while she was on tour with me in Europe when the Chili Peppers were touring for Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Um, uh, and she, she, uh, she was, we were reading a lot about Marcel Duchamp, and she was, she had an idea for a movie that was sort of based on what she was getting from his ideas, and it was a, you know, it was a short film, and it was supposed to look sort of like it was done, you know, uh, in the in the 30s or whatever, and uh, and so I was supposed to play Rose Salavie, who was Marcel Duchamp's alter ego, was named Rose Salavie, and it was him in drag, and he would he would do, you know, he would he would sign certain things, Rose Salavie, uh, like like 
for instance, he would sign. Uh, well, yeah, he would. You know, he would. He would make pieces under that name, and and uh, and so she wanted me to play him, and so that photograph on the cover of the record was was a was a, a still that I picked out from the movie, which I think she plans on editing that movie soon. Yeah, because she's making, she wrote a script with her friends, with two of her friends that they've been working on now for like a year, and it's a really good script, and they're hoping to make it into a movie, so she wants to have that short film to show to people as something that she's done, you know, because she stars in it, and I actually play a couple of characters in it as well. Um, is it something you've already shot, or...? Yeah, that's what the still is from. Yeah, the cover of Neon Blue is from, from the that movie. Okay. But we didn't. Don't we, the whole movie shot? We just didn't edit it. So, and she's gonna edit it. Um, Rick Rubin at the time wanted to edit it into a, the form of a video, but I was just so unorganized at that time. Uh, to be driven to do anything like that. And I think actually Tony didn't like the idea of just editing it as a video because she had it in her head that it was a film, Sorry. that it was a short film, and she thought it would be a waste of the material to put it in the form of a video. Mm -hmm. But it did come out with a, a stuff, the movie that Johnny Depp and Libby did. Yeah. Was that just something the record company's idea? No, no, that, that movie was made before the record existed. That movie was made before I even planned on releasing oh, right. the songs, yeah. Like, uh, at that time I just used to play people my music, uh, and if they would ask if I was going to do anything else with it or release it, I would say no. And uh, Johnny and Gibby, they, you know, I was living in that house that had paint all over the walls and all over the floor, and and uh, and there was a it was a really uh, spiritually dense atmosphere there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of you know uh, there there was there was a lot of there was a lot of activity in the house so ghost activity and like there was a, it was just really spiritually infested with with uh, with unex inexplicable kind of things, you know, it, and uh, a lot of movement, you know, coming from nowhere. There, it wasn't a still house at all. There was a lot of movement all the time in the house. So, uh, so you know, they they wanted to film it. The you know, I think it was. Uh, I liked the film. Uh, but it, you know they they picked what songs that they wanted to use of the songs that I had played them and Gibby asked me to recite some poetry from one of my notebooks into a little tape recorder so that's also in there. Okay. So that was never part of the song. The no, no, that's that's uh, that was just something that, that they want they wanted to have me reading poetry in it so I so I just opened up one of my notebooks and read it into a little piece of tape recorder and they. They put it over the music that way. Yeah. Um, there's a few songs about Smile from the Streets you hold that um, were said to be recorded straight onto an audio cassette recorder. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And there's been a lot of debate as to which songs those songs are. Uh, um, this, they're the ones where I'm screaming. And, and, uh, to me, sound quality-wise, it's real obvious. It's the last song for sure is one, right. and the other two, I, I'm not sure exactly what numbers right. they There's are. One called uh, "I Can't See Until I See Your Eyes." Is that one of them? I think so. Yeah. And then a song called "More." Is that another one? I think so. Yeah. You're probably right. I mean, I, I don't, probably. Is everyone's, you know, oh, not this song, not this song. Yeah, no, I can't see until I see your eyes is definitely one. More, I think, is one. I mean, I'm the titles for that album were really arbitrary. I, I didn't have, you know, I, I didn't have titles, so, and I, and I just wrote them real quick at it at it at a point in time when I was so disconnected from 
the music itself. That's why a lot of the time I, you know, when, when people tell me these titles, they seem so unrelated to where the song came from because at the time that I wrote the titles, I couldn't have written a song to save my life, you know. <laughs> So the titles on Smoke Street Street's Hold were just sort of the, picked at the last minute. Yeah, but just because they needed titles, yeah. Why didn't they go with the uh, untitled type of uh, format? He would have. He just was doing whatever I told him to do, and I suppose I just thought it, I should make titles, you know. I mean, the David kept Nelson? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, they're, uh, I mean, but the songs on, on, on uh, usually just a t-shirt, the reason they were untitled wasn't because I couldn't think of titles for the songs, at, at, because at that time I was still sort of in that same artistic place as I had been when I wrote the songs, even though I was painting at that time instead of doing music, but, but I was still very... Like, at the time that I put together the, the package for Neandre Ledes, I was... I had stopped, I pretty much stopped playing music and I was mostly spending all my time painting and drawing, but I was still very much in the same sort of artistic realm, you know. And, and, uh, the, uh, the, the reason that the songs, that half the songs on that album were entitled was because I didn't want titles to, uh, interfere with, with the, uh, with the fact that all of those songs were usually just a t-shirt. Like, I think of them not so much as Untitled 1, Untitled 2, but usually just a t-shirt number one, usually just a t-shirt number two, usually just a t-shirt number three, you know. Like, like... Gallo, um, the, uh, the director, he directed the videos for, uh, to record water. Yeah. Um, was that concept something, his idea to make a video for every song, or is that something Well, that no, they, 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 uh, the, um, our managers, my managers, um, they said that VH1 had a, or no, MTV2 had a, had a, had a, uh, wanted to do a thing where they played the whole album, and they said, could, could you come up with uh because vincent vincent originally was just supposed to do the video for going inside but then uh our manager said if if he can do a video for moments have you as well that would be good so i said uh so so i told vincent and and he and he uh, said he would if he thought of something and it turned out we shot a really good looking thing for moments have you of me just sitting there playing the song and then uh our man, my manager Peter Minch said that uh, you you uh, is it could Vincent put together some kind of visuals for the whole album? It doesn't necessarily have to be a video. It just it could be anything. Just so something that can go on the screen because MTV Two does a thing where they play a whole they play an album in its entirety if the band gives them some kind of visuals. So you know. We put it together. I think they probably showed it once, you know. Um, but but uh, but uh, you know, Vincent uh, Vincent, uh, you know, really, you know, nicely put together a whole a whole thing of the whole album. You've seen it? Yeah. 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 That's what I was wondering. If it's his intentions were to make a video for every song, or just extra footage and it's like well I could probably shape up enough yeah he just took the footage that we had that we had extra from the the one day of video shoots you know that the going inside video took one day and moments have you we did the night before and and uh and that you know that was the whole uh he he just took stuff from from that footage to make a little miniature video for every song most of them were just loops you know right. yeah. and and uh, it was just so so MTV2 could have something to to show okay. is um, something you ever the company the Warner Brothers release uh, I seriously doubt it mm-hmm. but but um but you know but I would I mean <laughs> you know I mean if I if I ever gotten into that sort of thing but um 
but who, you know, I know a, I know a lot of people at the record company feel bad that people didn't really get to see the videos uh, for the record, so, you know, I don't know what, what'll be done. You know, I mean, I think stuff like that should be sold through the guy who runs the my website, you know? I mean, right. that would be good. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think people should be able to buy that thing that Vincent made. Yeah. And Vincent does, too. I mean, Vince, you know, it's something Vincent's really proud of. Yeah. yeah um, something a lot of the fans, you know, they get to see. I know. They want to see. I know. I, I think we should probably make it available through the Internet, you know. Right. I just haven't been in communication with that guy who runs the website. He's so nice that he's kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't force himself on me and and I just I just don't really have my mind there but if <coughs> but you know if I was hearing from him or whatever I would I would uh, I would try to make it you know to make yeah to, just to make that available to make my my other four track stuff from the last few years available yeah because yeah, you said that there was two other CDs that you came out with before to record water yeah two two CDs worth of stuff that, that just my friends that I gave just to my friends and I guess none of those friends are uh, you know took it upon themselves to 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 make it available to people over the internet because they're all very close friends they're not you know right would you feel bad if people were listening to it because I know there's some songs that were released on the internet yeah 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 that's the first ones that I did those came from a cassette though those weren't that that wasn't stuff that I burned to a CD, oh. and so there were sound quality. Um, right. No one's on the internet. The quality just gets worse and worse. So yeah, I know. I the C the CD, you know, um, the CD that I, the C, the CD of uh, that that I uh, made. The first one has like twenty songs, and the second one has like thirteen songs. And and uh, and I'm definitely gonna make them available through the internet. You know, I guess at one point I was imagining. I guess the the thing is, a lot of this stuff on the first one might end up in the Vincent Gallo movie that I'm doing the soundtrack for, which is which uh, which will which will be done at some point after the Chili Peppers record. Okay. This movie called Brown Bunny. Mm-hmm. Have you read the script for that? Mm-hmm. You're not in the movie though, you just your songs are in it? Right. Oh, okay. How are you doing right now? Yeah. All right. Um, some more questions. Sorry, I think so. Um uh, do you play on Harry Farrell's new album? No, not on his new album. Josh does. Josh does? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm one song. Um you did a song called Rev, I think, with Tom Morello and Harry. Right. Yeah. That's just something really old that just no, that that was from it was from a, about a month before I joined the Chili Peppers this last time. I um, Perry and Stephen and a few uh, and a few Yes Men were uh, were recording a uh, were recording you know Perry what was supposed to be Perry's album and uh, and so so I went over there and I played on it. Again, it was one of those. You know, it kind of made me feel similar to how the tricky thing made me feel. Only, only I was less, only I was less confident in myself as a musician at the time. So I think it hurt me a little more. You know, when when I went over there to work with Perry and I, I you know played the best I could play, but I had some other guy like, you know, jumping on like at the second there was any moment for any creativity, this other guy would just sort of. Jump out! Oh no! Something needs to be written. I'll I'll take care of it. You know, like, like the. At the time, I I you know I was I had just gotten out of the hospital. I was just getting started playing music again, and uh, and uh, you know the there there was it was just like Perry. Uh, mm, no, no, he just, you know, he had me play on that one song, and then said, "Oh, we'll be here, you know, we'll we'll uh, we'll call you, we'll call you if we need you, that kind of thing." And uh, 
we'll be in touch very soon, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and and uh, and uh, and I guess at a certain point he had Tom Morello add more guitar on the song, and uh, and then the. Uh, and what what there is on the record, I really don't hear myself playing at all. I, I, I maybe for like literally one or two chords, I think maybe I hear myself for a second. But, you know, if I am on there, it's not with any sort of, like it's Tom Morello that has the big sort of guitar tone. I, I'm, if I am on there, I remember what I played was with a really cheap, small sounding, you know, sort of new order kind of guitar tone. It wasn't. It wasn't like. Uh, I mean, I don't hear myself really on the recording. And on Tricky's thing, you know, there's this big like bum 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 on that song, Girls. That just you know, to let my fans know that's not me. That's my my guitar is a little funky one, but high, you know. Uh, it's Tricky's guitar player playing the big oh, fat yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, that was already on there. We just played to an already existing track, you yeah. know. Is like uh, the Wonder Woman song was the only one that we uh, that we that we did from the ground up. The the song Girls was his band and me and Flea added. Is Flea on it? No. Yeah, we played on it, but he didn't use what Flea did, and you know, I just added something to it. But yeah, uh, Perry's. You know, he's another person who just like. The reason I didn't really enjoy recording with him on that occasion is because he, again, he's you know telling everybody what to do all the time, and and doesn't really doesn't really let the magic happen because he's always telling you what to do, you know. And it's just like if he would just let things happen around him like he did when Jane's addiction started, you know, it would it would you know where he had another real creative force like Eric Avery playing with him, it, it, I think it would result in, in better music, you know, than what he's doing now, where it's one person telling everybody what to do. It's like, you know, that's why, that's why when I was a kid, he, like there was a time when I was, I was qualified, I, I was good enough and knew enough of his music to play with Frank Zappa, and I had a chance to audition for him if I would have, if I, if I wanted to, but I, even though I was starving at the time, I, I suddenly realized that the day that I, that I would have had a chance to, to walk up to him and say, I, you know, I, I can play, you know, about 30 of your, you know, of your, of the polyrhythmic, you know, instrumentals, and, which I know is more than any guitar player, you know, probably in the world could play at that time. Like, I, I mean, I really had been studying it seriously for about a year but I just realized at that point I don't want to just be in a band with somebody telling me what to do you know I want to do what I want to do write my own songs and you know be like if I'm going to play music with people I want people who who know what to do I don't want to tell people what to do you know I want to and I don't want to be told what to do you know music uh, you know music should be something that's uh that's an expression of freedom, not an expression of like fascism. You know. Right. Um, about your recent solo tour, you did for to record water, played a few dates in Europe, and here you know New York and L.A. Um, were any of them real standout highlights, or how did you feel about the audience reaction to seeing you play as a solo solo artist? It was great everywhere. the The only uh, the only shows that I you know, it, like it, the only shows that I that I really the only show that I didn't really feel like uh, like I was making the people feel like I wanted to was in Germany. But most places, people make me feel so good. You know, people are really warm, and you know, the New York show and the Toronto show and the LA shows they were all really a lot of fun and. I just couldn't get, I couldn't ask for a better reception from the people who were there, you know, the, um, it really, it makes me feel, you know, so proud to be alive and so proud that I've 
spent the last few years the way I have and dedicated myself to making myself a better musician the way I have, it really uh, it makes it also worth it when I go up on stage and, and make people happy with my music. Oh, and the show that I don't have a good memory of also, I suppose, wasn't the best show. <laughs> the show in Santa Barbara. Um, yeah, but I, I, I barely even remember that show. I, I literally blacked out about halfway through it. You know. I hardly even remember the beginning of it, really. I think I might have already been kind of blacked out before I even went on stage. What do you count for the future for the Peppers and you know, just to record and then do you think you're going to do a smaller tour to not wear yourself out so much? Or well, it didn't wear me out, you know. It didn't, it didn't really wear anybody out, actually. Yeah. yeah. It, um, it just seemed like such a long tour. It was long. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it won't be... Well, the, the good thing about now is, uh, you know, assuming, you know, God willing, that, you know, we, we make the record when we're planning on making it, at the time that that uh, that we released Californication, as our managers explained to me, we were building an audience from scratch because their last album had been a few years before and it hadn't been very successful. So we were sort of starting fresh, you know. Um, and now we've we've it's not that same situation like with Californication the first few months of touring that we did was to set up the album we did a tour of high you know for high school students we did tour promotional tours in Europe for radio you know there was a, there was a lot of setup to the whole thing which when we release this album we'll be able to just go straight into touring arenas again the way we that we've been so you know the tour will be shorter, I think, just because of that alone. But then, but then also, you know, it's because we've already got our audience. You know, um, at that time, if we would have started playing shows right off the bat, they would have been smaller shows. So that's why we made, you know, we made it worthwhile by by playing, doing more promotional type tours to begin with. Yeah. So, you know, I I'm. Uh, but you know, Flea does want to make sure that he spends a certain amount of time with Clara. But at the same time, you know, uh, this, you know, he feels like this is this is his job. This is what he does. So he, you know, he he still plans on going out and touring. I mean, he was he he reached a low point in the middle of the last tour, like around January of nine. I mean of of uh, 2000 but uh, he got stronger and stronger as the tour went on especially the last six months in America he felt stronger at the end of it than he did at the beginning of it and uh, and the same with me and the same with uh, you know the same with everybody except Chad because he doesn't uh, you know he doesn't take care of himself <laughs> <you know? laughs> But still, he held up. Actually, at the end, he was really good. His down point was maybe like halfway through the American tour. He started like having a little too many late nights with Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you and Dave Grohl ever jam any old Nirvana songs or no. around or soundtrack? He can No, I think you know he maybe he came on stage with us a couple of times to uh, play the punk rock part at the end of P and maybe jam a little bit or, or they. You know, they would come on stage and, um, like at that that last the last show. Like a gag. Huh? Like a gag kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. They came on stage and were like jumping all over everybody and stuff. They were funny. <laughs> they were spaghetti funny. on chat. Huh? Did they, they throw like spaghetti on chat? Yeah, they were having all their pranks like that. <laughs> Did you guys pull any good ones on them? Oh no, it wasn't us. You know, it was Chad. <laughs> And his pranks weren't as good as theirs, you know. <laughs> he put the, I think he, did, what did he do? He put their, he put their lighting guy, on the last night he made it impossible for them to play. He like put their lighting guy, he locked their lighting guy into a box 
and put the box in the middle of the stage. <laughs> and, the, you know, it was uh, not something that we had any, that the other, the rest of us had anything to do with. It was all Chad. What's the new vibe on the, on the new album? Like, what artists are inspiring you on this album? Mm, well, for me, uh, for me, I, I think, uh, some of my, I mean, I mean, some, some of it is, is a continuation of, of the sort of, uh, of the sort of things that I was inspired by for the last record, like Matthew Ashman from Bow Wow Wow and, and, uh, and you know, Bernard Sumner from Joy Division and in New Order, but um, but some uh, some of the stuff that I I'm I'm also now because I'm because I've because I've my skill has gotten better as a guitar player between the last album and now is uh, I've gotten much more into chords and uh, and the the kind of textural guitar playing of of uh, like Johnny Marr and uh, John McGow from Susie and the Banshees and um, and John Caruthers from from uh, Susie and the Banshees uh, and I've been uh, that that more sort of uh, a lot of my playing on the new stuff has has more dense kind of chords that you it's less obvious what's going on like uh, it sounds th- there's more uh it's a more kind of a wet sound now and and I think it would be it's the kind of stuff that would be like it would be really hard for somebody to learn how to play because the chord there's so many strange chords in this stuff that I'm playing now but I mean you know the feeling of it is 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 a more vibrant version of the same feeling I I, I hear a more a, a bigger energy in this stuff than is on Californication there's more, some of it's more rock and roll because there's also the 50s music is sort of an inspiring, has been inspiring me a lot in the last few months too. So that's in some of the music as well as there's a, some glam influence in some of the music. And there, there's, there's, he, there's more heavy, like there's more fast stuff and there's more heavy stuff than there was before. And, uh, yeah, and there's there's you know as far as like as far as the guitar playing, I just I'm definitely even though I was listening to to like the Smiths when we were making the last record, I couldn't make heads or tails of what Johnny Marr was doing on the guitar, and now I I can learn his stuff, and I've 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 gotten better at, at understanding uh, at getting inside of his style, so it's affected my guitar playing in a in a way that that uh. I, the the those chords sort of sound like they're coming out of thin air more so than than that every chord is just the one thing that it means. There's there's more. It's more opened up and has like uh, more of nature in it or something. I I'm really happy about um, finding new ways of expressing you know of expressing these feelings you know. Um, you know, I hope uh, I hope my playing can constantly change. For a while, I was going through a, through a, through an Eddie Van Halen phase <laughs> during the making of this record. So I I was going to rehearsal and playing real uh, fast a lot and stuff. And now I'm back to playing real simple again. But it was a good little phase for me to go through. Um, uh, it was, you know, it was it was a lot of fun for a couple of months there. But but uh, you know you might get a second or two of that on the album, but but it'll 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 probably be mostly you know playing my solos like I'm a retard again. <laughs> <laughs> I I I you know I I to me I I, I like uh, I like it when each note really means something, and I don't like it when it's the group of notes that means something, which is what you normally have with somebody like Eddie Van Halen. And, and when I say Eddie Van Halen, I'm talking about the first. You know the Van Halen albums with David Lee Roth on them, and and uh, you know it when it's the group like I I just feel like it's 
I just feel like it's my sort of uh, responsibility to uh, to play things where where each note means something as opposed to a, a cluster of notes meaning something. I mean, or a group of notes strung together means. Um, it's mostly what I find it exciting and what I find challenging and stuff. And I know that like playing fast and stuff, it it, it uh, it's a it's a sort of a dead end, you know. And so that's why I can't really let myself get too far into it, you know. But you're still technically capable, capable of it, yeah. You know. Thanks, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank what, what time is it? It's uh, about 1.30. 1.30, yes. Can you find a few things? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a proto-pike. Um, I saw her play the... Uh, I was thinking about it when I was talking to you. I do have a copy of it. You know, I mean, I, I, I could give you this one and then... You want me to set it back to you? No, I can give you this one and... Oh yeah, you can burn a CD. Can you burn a CD out here and give it back to me? Yeah. Because I... I is this the one that has the, uh, the 20 card? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Will you? Sure. Go ahead and send it to him. I'm sorry. I promise. <laughs> I, I've, I've read the book before. I've sent it some pictures of like, the paintings that he did. To put it on his website. I live here in LA, so. Can you just give it up and see? Uh, I, I just
around you.